Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs webinar on providing advocacy to children with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their non-offending parents. My name is Logan Michael and I'm the Child Advocacy Specialist here at WICSAP and I've had the pleasure of coordinating this webinar with our own in-state expert, Teresa Fears, from the ARC of Spokane. Trainings on pertinent topics such as this are one of the ways in which WICSAP strives to support your work as advocates for sexual assault survivors. For those of you who may be less familiar with the coalition, we are also available to our members for any questions or resource needs you may have in your daily work. Before I turn things over to Teresa, I just wanted to cover a few logistics for today. Hopefully everyone is hearing the audio okay through your phone line. Please let us know via the chat box if you're having any problems with volume or clarity. We're also going to be playing a few videos during the webinar today, and in order to hear these, you will need to have the volume on your computer speakers enabled. So those videos um, are not going to come through your phone line. Everyone's phones have been muted just to keep the conference um, clear today, so we will be using the chat function in the bottom corner of your screen for any questions and comments. Teresa is going to be monitoring these and um, responding as we go, and then hopefully we'll have a few minutes for questions at the end of the training as well. You will be able to download today's presentation slides from the follow-up email that confirms your attendance and training hours. That email will be sent shortly after the webinar, so be sure to check your inbox and spam folder for that. You can also find the recording and materials from today on our website under trainings and events, and those should be posted within the next week or two if you would like to access that. If you're sharing a computer with a colleague and either didn't register or didn't log into the webinar using your personal link, if you wouldn't mind sending me a quick email with your information so we know who is joining us today. And this also helps us to make sure that everyone on the call receives proof of their training hours. My email is logan at wixap.org, L-O-G-A-N at W-C-S-A-P dot O-R-G. And finally, as always, we would greatly appreciate your taking just a few minutes to fill out the evaluation at the conclusion of today's webinar. We are very excited to be able to facilitate this training and share Teresa's expertise with you today. She truly is <clears throat> <clears throat> a tremendous resource in our state on serving survivors and doing prevention work with people who have disabilities. So without further delay, I will let her get started. Well, thank you. That was really nice. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Sounds great. Fantastic. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, playing with the computer. There we go. I know that that uh, title is really poetic and uh, lyrical, providing advocacy to children with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their non-offending parents. A um, bit of a poet. But really when we talk about providing advocacy to children, we're talking about connecting with their parents. But let's get started with um, what kind of experience the people who are participating have working with people who have disabilities. And you can, if you want to, type in something in the chat. Just give me a, a sense of whether or not anybody in the crowd is a sibling or a parent of a child with a disability, because I think you're going to hear this training a little bit differently than the people who have no connection to disability. We have one response. So it looks like most of the people, oh, here we go. Like there's a little bit of experience out there. I want to uh, thank everybody who's typing in an answer to this. It's very helpful. So we've got several people who wrote in to say that they are either a parent or have a sibling or have had some experience. So that's great. So we'll build on that. Wow, a lot of people. 
Ooh, great, great. Okay, so it's interesting what people outside the disability arena think a disability is. Most people, if you don't have a family member or you don't work at an agency like the ARC, which is a service provider for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, your knowledge probably comes from movies and television, which I'll tell you, not altogether accurate. So one of the common misinterpretations or misbeliefs about disability is that it's a single thing. It's like there is disability. It's, it's over there, one unit. Uh, we have that problem with our police department here. They think if they have the training on mental illness, they're um, adequately prepared to work with children who have Down syndrome or autistic disorders because they see it as just being this one overriding thing. Disability is just a thing. Well, actually, disability isn't a single thing. It's a whole bunch of interconnected things. It's less a tree and more like a forest. Some of the areas of disability include physical disabilities, intellectual, developmental, and mental and emotional. These areas of disability can be genetic, such as with Down syndrome, present at birth, but not genetic, such as fetal alcohol syndrome, created through birth trauma, such as cerebral palsy, or acquired before the age of 18, such as somebody with a traumatic brain injury or somebody who had a suffocating experience, such as a near drowning experience. Note that all the trees are independent and yet they are connected. Thus, a person with a genetic disorder, such as Down syndrome, can also have a mental health disorder, such as depression. Or a person may have multiple physical disabilities and no intellectual or developmental disability at all. Disability is a complicated set of variables that are completely unique to that individual. There are, however, general similarities that can be drawn about particular disabilities. But, as with people without disabilities, all people with disabilities are unique unto themselves. Disability is complicated and unique to the individual. I think that's what I really want you to take away from this. I'm looking at the chat. So what is a developmental disability? Well, in the state of Washington, we have a definition that is used to determine whether or not a person can receive services from the Developmental Disabilities Administration, or DDA. And according to Washington state law, a disability is, um, the way they word it is, it's attributable to, so they're looking at what the causal factors are, and they list intellectual disability, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, autism, or another neurological or condition related to intellectual disability that requires treatment similar to that for individuals with an intellectual disability. So when they say intellectual disability, what exactly is it they're talking about? Well, an intellectual disability means significantly sub-average general intellectual functioning existing concurrently with deficits in adaptive behavior and are manifested during the developmental period, which means that somebody has difficulties in areas of cognition, which can include memory, attention, uh, reading and learning abilities. So in the state of Washington, to have a developmental disability, this has to be identified before your 18th birthday and it has to be an event that occurred before your 18th birthday. So a traumatic brain injury at 10 is a developmental disability, and a traumatic brain injury at 21 is not. Developmental delay, however, means a child between the ages of three through eight who is experiencing a de delay in their educational performance. The reason I bring that up is parents may use a variety of words to explain their child's condition, and those words are really going to be given to them by professionals that the uh, um, parent is receiving services from. 
So you may hear a lot of things. Very few parents come in and say, you know, I have a child with an intellectual and developmental disability. They'll tell you they have a child who, who has Down syndrome, or they may have a relative who has an um, autism spectrum disorder, but this is what they're really talking about. One of the ways that developmental disability is identified is receiving services from the state. For example, Adult Protective Service, when looking at vulnerable adults, determines the vulnerability by whether or not you receive state services. This actually is not the best way to determine whether or not the person in front of you has an intellectual or developmental disability, because there are a lot of reasons that parents do not have children receiving services. And that doesn't mean that the child in front of you does not have uh, a disability. Some of the reasons are parents make too much money um, they're not eligible for services. The child may be eligible, but the parent may not be receiving services because of their income. Also, some families get right on board with supporting that child, getting that child in physical therapy, and if they are wildly successful in giving that child skills such that they no longer look like they have a disability, they also don't receive services. So although um, asking that question is, are you receiving services from DDA or the Division of Developmental Disabilities might be an indicator, it's no guarantee that that person is in fact um, receiving services or that lack of services mean that there's not a person with a disability on board. So how many children, 18 and under, with all forms of disabilities do we have in the state of Washington? So we'll do a quick um, chat quiz, and your numbers to choose from are 20,000, 40,000, or 60,000. So how many children are there in Washington, 17 and under, with disabilities, according to the most recent census, 20,000, 40,000, or 60,000? You guys can't see the slides, right? You can't see the slides that are coming up? Oh, good. You can't. I just want you to know it's weird to do a training where nobody's talking back. Wow. So well done, people who knew it was 60,000. And then say to yourself, in my agency, how many kids with disabilities am I seeing? And if you're not seeing a significant number, you've got to wonder why. Because we have at last census approximately 60,000 children in the state of Washington. For example, in Spokane, kids receiving special education services through in Spokane County alone number almost 5,500. So I believe it indicates that we have a large number of families out there who have children who may not not be receiving services from sexual assault service providers. So the next part of our training has to do with rates of abuse for people with disabilities. This is fairly new information, and it isn't widely uh, disseminated yet. So I'm pretty sure you guys must be aware of the rates for typically developing children. It's a one in four and for girls and uh, one in six for boys, according to um, Finkel Horror in the Journal of Adolescent Health. However, children with any form of a disability are, are at two to four times higher, that rate. Two to four times higher. So if we do the math, we're talking about either a 50 or 100 percent prevalence for children with disabilities. And children with intellectual disabilities are, at high, are the highest risk group. Of all the children with disabilities, children with intellectual and developmental disabilities are at the highest end of the abuse spectrum. So what are the risk factors for children with intellectual and developmental disabilities? One of the greatest risk factors are our societal beliefs about people with disabilities in general. 
Some of the dangerous societal beliefs that create risk for children are that uh, children with disabilities can't learn, so we're not going to teach them anything. That people with disabilities grow up to have no self-control. That somebody with an intellectual disability is inherently born to be immoral. That they are either oversexed or completely unsexual. And then that they cannot feel like normal people. Uh, recently, in 2013 in Los Angeles, United School District brought a professional in after there was a uh, conviction for repeated sexual assaults in the school system. And one of the professionals, along this theme of don't feel like normal people, asked that a nine-year-old girl with Down syndrome be given less money than her typically developing victim peers because he identified her intellectual disability as a protective factor. She was protected from the harm of multiple sexual assaults because of her disability. So that feeds into this belief that somehow the disability means that they aren't feeling things the way that other people feel things. Therefore, there's not really any harm done. Some of the other myths are uh, the myth of eternal innocence. Um, a lot of people like to talk about children with Down syndrome being closer to God and special little angels. And the other is that they're not fully human. Somehow, having an intellectual disability makes them just not as real and as human as the rest of us. Those are huge societal beliefs, and they have a massive impact on how people interact with people with disabilities. And some of the people who are interacting are, for, are for example, police. If a police officer comes in and interviews a person with a disability, I have been told that they don't try and pursue that because they think the person with an intellectual disability is an unreliable witness by benefit of the disability alone. Second risk factor, lack of education. So we'll stop with what the children aren't getting. If you believe that your child can't learn, you're never going to teach it. So we're not going to give them sex ed. We're not going to teach them about healthy relationships. And we're not going to talk about setting boundaries on other people because they can't learn. So we don't have to. We're off the hook. The other is um, parents' education. Parents of children with disabilities are, on the whole, not knowledgeable about rates of abuse with children with disabilities, which kind of surprised me when I got the job here at the ARC. They found my job very distressing and actually didn't want to hear about it. Some of the other parental educational deficits, including not being able to recognize dangerous behaviors in other adults. Uh, they don't know how to confront adults who have behaviors of concern. They don't understand the importance of education to their own children. And I've had parents tell me that they have so many things going on that the idea of their child having a sex life at any point in their life is so overwhelming that they're going to wait till later. The public school system kind of feeds into this. Here in Spokane, in District 81, Children who are typically developing start their sex ed in the fourth grade, but children with an intellectual disability aren't offered any sex ed until the seventh grade, which is contrary to good education. Children with intellectual and developmental disabilities need information broken down and presented earlier for maximum repetition and presented in a variety of ways, and we do just the opposite. If we offer it at all, and not all school districts in Spokane County offer, any sex ed to students with disabilities, we wait until they're closer to puberty to offer them anything at all. And that goes back to our beliefs about disability, the belief that people really don't need that information so we can wait or get rid of it altogether. And the disability itself can be a risk factor. To have an intellectual disability sometimes means that your processing speed is slower, so it's harder for people to understand what's happening in the moment which makes it easier 
for uh, somebody who's figured out that this person is thinking quickly to act very quickly in the moment. It is also um, that a child's physical disability may require them to have a number of caregivers. It's not uh, unlikely that a child could have as many as 15 or 20 caregivers by the time they were in grade school, depending on the nature of their disability. Additionally, children with physical disabilities and uh, speech and language disorders will have a variety of uh, therapists that have access to them. They also require uh, special education services, such as bus drivers, uh, staff in the classroom. And finally, the, um, oh, this is so hard, not getting any feedback from people. It just feels very weird. It's too bad. So the disability itself can actually increase the vulnerability of a person who has a disability to a sexual assault. To provide advocacy to child victims, you've got to connect with those parents. To connect, it's important that you understand how the presence of a child with a disability impacts the entire family, particularly that uh, the relationship between the parents. We're in a unique position because in America and across the world, this is the first generation of parents who have been expected to bring up at home, a child with a disability. Even in my generation, uh, my siblings who were born in the 60s, it was still common for parents of a child with disability to put that child out at our local um, disability facility, which in Spokane was Lakeland. It was still expected that a large number of parents would institutionalize their children. However, the current generation have been strongly encouraged and in fact expected to keep their kids at home. Unfortunately, the services have not grown along with this expectation. Most of the programs for children to remain at home were originally designed for people over 60s and are almost completely unsuitable for families with children. For example, until recently, required training for people who wanted to care for their own child at home with a disability was exactly the same as for a person with dementia over 60. The material was not modified to reflect caring for a child and was consequently of very little use to the caregivers. It wasn't free, however, so families actually had to pay out of pocket to take a training to take care of their own children when the training focused almost entirely on people over 60s. The home life of parents of kids with a disability is really significantly different than that of um, parents with typically developing children. It's even different from parents of kids with mental health problems. I had children with mental health problems and emotional problems, and my life was still more like a typically developing child than like a parent of a child with a disability. The presence of disability in a child changes the dynamics for the entire family. For example, family obligations change massively. So you can see the blue, that's like a typical family. So your family and social obligations might include the extended family, your friends, your church, your social groups. But if you have a child with a disability, your obligations are now expanded, especially in the first three to five years, to include some, if not all, of the following professions. Physical therapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, specialty dentists, specialty pediatricians, special education programs, disability advocacy organizations, behavioral intervention specialists, specialized social recreational program for the child, audiologist, birth to three programs, developmental disabilities administration case managers, in-home caregivers, respite workers, and nurses. The consequence of this significantly busier life is that 
one parent, generally the mother, either reduces their work hours or leaves employment altogether to manage caregiving and uh, the schedule of programs and services. I get this information from a local study that we had done here, and I compared that to an Ohio State study of families with disabilities, and I compared that to a national study, and that all that information was compared to an international study in Britain, and the same pattern shows up. Based on the needs of a child, one parent inevitably leaves the workforce, and that is almost always the mother, which instantly brings down the income of the family, and it alters how long husbands work, and it alters when most people plan to retire. But what does it do to the family itself? What about family dynamics? Well, in a typically developing family, you have what's shown on the left side, where you might have one or two parents, and then they interact with the children more or less equally. However, a child with a disability becomes the center of family life, not just for the parents, but for the other siblings, if there are any other siblings as well. The degree of disability and the requirements of a child with a disability will impact how intensely this change occurs. This unexpected change in family life includes loss of dreams for the future and can be very traumatic for the entire family. Many families, when they discover that their child has a disability, go through a grieving process similar to that of Dr. Kubler-Ross's stages of grief. Stages of grief. They go through denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and possibly acceptance. Some families move through the stages and some struggle with those stages for the entire life of the child. The first three years tend to be more disorganized for the family. They must learn to cope with not only the diagnosis and its emotional and financial implications, but the stress of managing multiple care appointments for the child while also trying to meet the other children's social obligations. One of the largest consequences of having a child with disabilities is the impact on income. If one parent is leaving the workforce, that leaves the other parent to carry the responsibility. I think it's fair to say that we sort of live in a two working parent world now where the expectation of income is based on not one person, but two people. And as you can see from this slide, which came from the Ohio study, even people with advanced degrees suffer losses of income. The loss of income, however, is more significant than just the money they no longer have. With a decrease in income, families have fewer resources at a time when they also have a greater need for medical care, gas for transportation, and home modification or adaption. The family also has less money for its own medical care, and families of children with disabilities are more likely to put off routine medical care. Studies have shown that parents and typically developing siblings actually have a higher rate of medical need than families without a child with disabilities. In addition to neglecting their own routine medical care, necessary uh, care such as orthodontics are also put off. Some children with disabilities have disabilities that are very hard on the family home. For example, they may punch walls out of frustration. They may be incontinent, soiling all the furniture or they may be in a wheelchair and in a fit of anger drive the wheelchair into the wall. With reduced income, there may not be enough money to make necessary repairs to the home and replace ruined furniture. This increases the isolation felt by people with uh, parents of children with a disability because of shame about the condition of the home. There's also less money for family recreation. Um, vacations need to be designed around the needs of the child with a disability and what they can tolerate, and socialization becomes problematic. These all lead to feelings of isolation and depression. Additionally, removal from the workplace increases 
the potential for depression through loss of identity that went along with that job. So you may leave teaching or nursing or social service and just become mom and caregiver. The greatest cost to parents is isolation. I hear this from my coworkers who have children with disabilities and all the research at every level bears this out. Isolation. It is the greatest emotional cost for parents of children with disabilities. The decrease in income also means that families no longer have resources to participate with family and friends in regular social activities. Additionally, parents have difficulty finding appropriate and affordable daycare for their child. Parents feel isolated. The isolation is due to the dropping of previous friendships when those friends do not understand the changed responsibilities. Families contribute to isolation through lack of understanding of the needs of the child, or they may blame the parent for the child's disability, or make unhelpful suggestions about what will help with the child, or imply that the child's behavior is due entirely to poor parenting. So what parents lose in addition to income are often friends. I was with a group of parents a couple of weeks ago, and all um, of the women in the room talked about how their families, who used to be a source of support before they had a child with a disability, were no longer a source of support because although the moms explained over and over again what the child needed, the families only heard, you have a kid that you cater to, and if you just quit catering to that kid, they'd quit acting like that, and we could all get together. So the people who used to be their supports can't be there for them anymore because they really don't understand it. One of my coworkers will probably headbutt the next person that tells her that her children's behavior is due to a lack of parental consistency. This video I thought really spoke well to the consequences of having a child with disability, the feeling torn and the um, emotional distress that some parents feel. My name is Manjit. My son is ill. He has autism. I've never heard Amanbir say mom. I've never heard Amanbir say his name or his sibling's name. Or... At the moment, this just seems so much to do and so much just to keep on top of on a daily basis. Yeah. You just have to keep trying and keep hoping that things improve. And you have to make certain choices that really mean that you have to put Amabir's needs first. When we get up of a morning, my two daughters, we don't even exchange good mornings. <laughs> it's, oh, how was he? You know, how was the night with him? And um, unfortunately, in June 2009, my brother passed away. And my last conversation that I had with my brother, I had my hand on the door to go. As soon as he turned to go into the kitchen to get us something to eat, I grabbed my daughter by her. I said, come on, let's go. And that was it. That was my last conversation with my brother. Because you're always thinking, I've got to be somewhere. I've got to do this. I've got to do something else. There's always you know, things that you've got to get in place. If... Um, it's a huge loss to me, it really is a huge loss. And I don't want to feel like that with my mum. So I want to spend that time with my mum. Other emotions parents report are guilt, regret, 
and depression. The guilt is, as you saw with this mom, and I hope the sound came through, was that when you focus so much on one child, the needs of other members of the family are also missing. So there's the worry that they're not doing enough for the other children while trying to make sure that they're doing enough for the child with a disability. So let's talk a little bit more about why it's hard for parents to have a kid with a disability. From the headlines, um, I think this speaks for itself. This man made this comment not once, but twice in two years, and he also ran for president in the last election. I have actually had people tell me that this is God's revenge on immorality. Mr. Brewster is a counselor in England, and that is like a um, like city council member. He made this statement twice. Uh, the first time he got recalled, and then he went back up for public office and got hired or uh, elected again, made the second statement and was again recalled. But I think this speaks to attitudes about people with disabilities that parents have to face every time they leave the house. And this talks about our societal attitudes towards people with disability. So I found it fascinating that somehow, because the child had Down syndrome, the parents who starved him to death only deserved um, probation, that somehow it wasn't really murder because, you know, he had Down syndrome, not really murder. So if we compare the divorce statistics to typically developing children, we have 30% more divorces in the first three years of the child's life. And over 10 years, 50% on top of the, the uh, normal divorce rates. The stressors that are reported by families are physical, emotional, and financial. They, are, they do include the reorganization of the family structure. Thus, more children with disabilities are in single-parent homes where the mother may be unable to work because of the needs of her child. The consequences to the families that do remain intact are that they are more likely to put off having additional children and are more likely to have permanent sterilization techniques. And the parents that stay together are less likely to have more children as um as soon as they originally had planned on it. Parents of children with disabilities are put in the role of advocates, which I'm sure you guys can appreciate, almost immediately, but they are not taught advocacy skills. It's an expectation with no training attached to it. But they become advocates for their children out of necessity. Advocacy begins, can begin if the doctor gives an incorrect diagnosis and the parents have to argue with the doctor to get a correct diagnosis. It can continue to insurance companies who may deny therapies. It may involve agencies that provide early childhood services and with the Developmental Disabilities Administration over whether a child is eligible or not. And that's just in the first three years. Entering to the public school system also brings with it what's called the Individualized Education Plan, or IEP. The IEP is a very thick, complicated document that teachers are taught how to use and parents are not. There are, can be as many as seven school staff personnel in a room with a single parent who is almost always the mom. 
So by the time you meet a parent who has a child who's been sexually assaulted, they may have already had to advocate with their children's doctor, argued with an insurance company, advocated with a parent, been misunderstood by their family, been alienated by their friends. And one of the biggest complaints I get from parents is people who don't understand them and judge them. Professionals who don't know about disability but insist that they do know about disability because they're the professionals are one of the greatest reported sources of frustration for parents. This is an example of a IEP meeting with a professional and I put it in because I think it really speaks to the frustration that a lot of parents have in dealing with professionals. Welcome to Timmy's IEP meeting. I am the VP and will be the administrative designee for this meeting. I am Timmy's mom and I just want to get my son the help he needs. He is in the fourth grade and cannot read. You will have a chance to discuss your parental concerns later so let's get started. We are holding this meeting at your request after trying RTI and having an SST meeting. Let's start with the assessment results for the WISC-4 IQ test. Timmy's full scale IQ is a 102, but he had some scaled scores and standard scores that were considered low average to borderline. What are you saying? I don't get it. Let's discuss the fact that Timmy cannot read. We will get to that. I am trained and knowledgeable and these results are valid and reliable. But Timmy cannot read. The next assessment was the Woodcock-Johnson 3 Achievement Test. Timmy's broad reading standard score was a 78. His reading fluency standard score was a 75 and his reading comprehension standard score was a 77. Does this mean Timmy cannot read? We will get to that. Remember, I am trained and knowledgeable and these results are valid and reliable. Also, I provided the assessments in Timmy's primary language. But Timmy cannot read. The next assessment was the TVPS assessment test for visual processing. Timmy's scaled score on visual memory was a 6 and his scaled score on visual spatial was a 5. I have now finished explaining all of the assessment results in clear, easy to understand language because I am trained and knowledgeable and these results are valid and reliable. It is now your turn to tell us your parental concerns. I have been telling you my parental concerns all along. Timmy cannot read. Please explain to me what everything you said meant because I still don't understand. Oh, all right. As I have already clearly explained, Timmy cannot read. Next time I am going to visit specialeducationadvisor.com before the meeting so that I am better prepared and understand what all of this means. So there was a question about comparing the rates of divorce for people with and without disabilities. And I get my information from, um, and of course I can't think of the name of the book, but it's uh, one of my reference books. And they're comparing disability to no disability. And the rate is almost twice that for parents of a child with a disability. And I will talk about the book I'm uh, referencing as a recommended uh, resource for WixApp later on. So this is my favorite because according to the experience of my coworkers and the parents I've talked to and the research I've done, this is sort of what it feels like to have a home with a child with a disability. They work really, 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 really hard just to keep things what they call normal, and if they actually want to do anything else, they've got to work 
even harder. Some of the mitigating factors that support families of children with disability include economic power of parents. Parents with more education and money are able to purchase services such as respite therapy and recreation than do medium or low income families. It's wise not to make any assumption about the family. This information I'm giving you is generic. It shows up in studies across the board, but every family in front of you is going to be its own unique family. So it's important to ask questions when scheduling appointments and to take into consideration obstacles that exist for the family. Even if you have a child with a disability yourself, remember this is an experience that is unique to each family. You cannot make assumptions about the family in front of you based on your own experience. You can, however, support that parent by sharing the commonality of your experience and the overriding bigger issues. What parents really want, what they really, really want, is to feel understood and not judged. The number one fear of parents of children with a disability, and they have a lot of fears, the number one fear is that that child is going to be hurt. The guilt and complicated feelings create a potential for enormous parental vulnerability. The vulnerability of the child magnifies the fears of the parent. Under the best of circumstances, families are trying to find and maintain a healthy balance. They often feel alone, isolated, and under, not understood. If a child with a disability has been sexually assaulted, the result is the same to the family as throwing a grenade at a tightrope walker. Over the last seven years, getting to know parents and trying to teach them about sexual abuse of children with disabilities has been extremely difficult for me. Many of them find it too awful to consider and I have seen fathers cry at the mere mention of the statistics. If the family's in your office and you're advocating for their child, the worst thing that can happen to that child has just happened to that child. I can't emphasize enough how Frightened parents of children with disabilities feel for the well-being of their child. All my coworkers mention it. All the parents I work with mention it. This terrible fear that something horrible is going to happen. And honestly, if they're in your office, something horribly horrible has already just happened. I mean, I can't get parents to think about sex ed, so... Sitting there with a child who's been sexually assaulted, really confronting them in an area that they really don't want to be confronted. If you're working with the parents of a child who's been sexually assaulted and that child has a disability, keep in mind how complicated their life is. They're not doing a lot of future thinking. They're very much in the now. Their concern is what we need to do to get through the day I have a sexual abuse prevention program, and I actually have gone up to my coworkers and asked them uh, when they were planning on giving their child sex ed. And one parent said, I have so much to do, I'm going to wait on that until there's a problem. Many parents focus their energy on the current needs of the child and the family. Future planning seems irrelevant. Thinking about things like sex ed, marriage, adult relationships, they want their kids to have that, but they have a really hard time thinking about the future in terms of action. So when you have them in your office, you need to do all your planning around the idea that this is going to have, this family is going to have a real narrow focus, and that focus is right this minute. What do we need right now? I think of it as like now-centeredness. So what do the parents need from you?
They need you to listen. A lot of professionals like to talk and offer help and make suggestions, but keep in mind that that family in front of you may have had dozens of professionals doing that, talking to them like that teacher did, giving them their advice, giving them their wisdom, and what they really don't do is listen. Listen. You'll be the rare professional that listens. Let them talk to you about the best way to work with their child. Let the parents know that you're willing to work your schedule around their needs. Learn as much as you can about that family and the child so that you can be better able to provide appropriate advocacy. Some things to consider asking are what is the best way to communicate with this child? Does the child have any sensory sensitivities? And if so, what are they? Uh, does anybody out there know what sensory sensitivities means? So the person who said yes, go ahead and somebody type in a definition of sensory sensitivity for everybody else. I'll read it out. Thanks. It is overstimulation to a particular sense. So, for example, many kids who have autism are easily overstimulated by sights and sounds, more so than a typically developing child. So your office, you need to, uh, when you have them in your office, you need to look around your office and see how stimulating your office is. It is easy to be visually overstimulated by a busy, attractive office. So lights need to be down, noise needs to be quiet. If you're a person with lots of artwork on your wall, before that child and their family comes in, you might want to think a little bit about taking some of the pictures down. So ask the parents, is that an issue for that particular child? You need the Yep, some of you guys are doing a great job. Some some of you really are on this. What parents need you to be is flexible. If that parent has been in the IEP, uh had an IEP experience, they've experienced a lot of inflexibility. And I'm not picking on teachers here. P teachers are busy, busy people. But they do tend to not want to work with parents on when to have meetings, so much as telling parents when to show up for meetings. Doctors, physical therapists, audiologists tend to be really rigid in their scheduling, so that's pretty tough for the family to try and accommodate everybody's um, scheduling limitations. Be the person who works around what time they have to the best of your ability. It will be a completely novel experience for that family. If you're going to be making appointments or referrals for the family, make sure that the referral source understands the family's need for flexibility. If you're making appointments, work with the family. It's so hard for families to have somebody call up and say, the appointment for your child is at this time, this time, and this time, because if they're lucky enough to still be able to work, they've now got to reschedule every other responsibility they have to meet the new responsibilities they've just been given. So let's be the novel professionals. Let's be the ones who are flexible with our time to meet their needs. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Do not be afraid to ask questions. Admit you don't know if you don't know. I had a parent call me, and her child had been raped, and she took her to the local sexual assault service center, and I won't name the city, and the therapist never asked a single question about the needs of that child. And when she got done, the parent was convinced that no good had been accomplished. The therapist didn't know about the child's processing speed, 
about her vocabulary. She didn't know how to read the child. She didn't know about her body language. She plugged that kid in like it was any other kid, did not adapt to the needs of the child, just kind of ran her through the mill, and that mother will probably never trust another sexual assault service agency again. In fact, when she called my office from an outlying city, it was to find a therapist who only worked with people with disability. And I'm afraid there is no such thing in this area anyway. Just ask. They'll be happy that you did. Some of the questions you might want to ask. Oh, we did the oversensitivity. Yeah, oversensitivity. I put it down twice. Communication. What's a good way to communicate with your child? Um, hmm. Parents may be connected with um, an advocacy organization, such as the ARC or um, an autism support group or a church support group. If they are, they may want those people involved in their support circle, and you may want to consider finding out whether somebody in the um, advocacy arena for disabilities is able to support that family and facilitate what you're doing. It's not all doom and gloom. Having a child with a developmental disability is, is harder work. It just really is. But it's not harder work really so much because of child. It's harder work because our systems are not set up to support the parents. With adequate support, adequate income, adequate education, parents would probably do a much better job and be under significantly less stress. So what are some of the things that parents say are strengths of having a child with a disability? Well, the married couples who don't divorce say that they feel closer to their spouse after the birth of the child with a disability. After learning how to advocate for their child, some report that they feel more confident in handling all other life issues as they arise. Families of a child with a disability tend to be more family-centered, and the siblings participate at all ages in family activities inside and outside of the home. The siblings have different relationships. Siblings report that they learn more about disability and they value their caregiving skills. They have become more accepting of others' differences and can become powerful advocates for their siblings as well. They appear to be more prone to going into helping professions such as social service or special education. And I can tell you that I am one of the few people here at the ARC who does not have either a child or a sibling with a developmental disability. Almost all the other people who work here work here because they have a connection to disability, and this to them seemed like a logical extension of that. Some of the other positive consequences reported by parents include feelings of greater love, learning not to take things for granted, increased tolerance and sensitivity, and learning to be patient. Those who attend religious services often feel that the experience has strengthened their faith, and many religious organizations can be an additional source of support for families. Relationships with other parents of kids with disabilities tend to replace the relationships of children uh, the previous relationships. Those relationships, usually formed in the first three years of the child's life, tend to be deeper and stronger than previous friendships for the parents. They can be fewer in number, but their um, the shared experience and the feeling of being understood and accepted is very, very, very important to the parents. So when you're doing an assessment and trying to find out who can help you in supporting the families, it's important to consider the victim's siblings, 
any church members, and friends. So what are my recommendations outside of family advocacy? I encourage you to build collaborations with the um, area agency that support people with disabilities. If you're not working with them already, reach out your hand and work with them now. Find out where your local ARC is. Find out about any services for kids with Down syndrome. Who's providing the greatest amount of support and assistance for children on the autistic spectrum? Start building those collaborations now. I have had very little success in trying to get area arts to reach out to sexual assault service centers because, as I said before, a lot of the people who work at these agencies are also parents. And I'm going to connect that to how parents struggle with this entire issue. So the very people at the agencies that you need to work with are also the people who have a really, really, really hard time because of their own personal connection to disability. So you reach out to them. Tell them that you need them to assist you with cross-training. You want them to come in and talk to you about disability. They'll do it. If there's another agency, see if you can't get on each other's advisory councils or boards so that you have a person who represents disability in your organization, and then they have a person who represents sexual assault service centers in their organization. Be open to cross-referrals. Those connections are going to get you connected to parents in a way that you'll never, ever be connected any other way. If parents are going to the um, ARC for a parent education class, that would be a great time for them to hear about sexual assault service centers and all the great things they have to offer. So you want to work on uh, cross-referencing as well. Design a plan for shared support of clients. Many parents find that advocacy organizations provide one-on-one -on -one support for parents or a parent-to-parent -parent program where they're hooked up with another parent. It may be that those advocacy organizations would be completely welcome at the table to assist you in supporting that family so that you can support the child with a disability. Here in Spokane, I have thrown that out to our local sexual assault service center so that they can actually offer an advocate to be in the room if that's what people want. Now, honestly, nobody's ever taken me up on it, but it's a nice little extra card to have in your deck to say, you know, we have somebody from the ARC who's willing to come down here and talk to you. I've had parents come in here not knowing where to go with their kids. I've had teachers not know where to go. Today, I am making a referral to a teacher to two young girls who came up and talked to me after a healthy relationship class because they were sexually assaulted and are still reeling from the harm, and they've never, ever been taken to counseling. I'm very happy because of my connection with our local sexual assault service center that I can make a referral to the teacher so that she can get those young ladies the information they need so that they can get into therapy and counseling. It's really weird to me, but this entire arena is almost completely ignored by the disability uh, service providers, which means that you're not getting your good work out there to the very people who need it the most. Know the disability resources in your community. If that parent doesn't have their child connected to the Developmental Disability Administration, it's okay to ask why. There's lots of reasons parents don't have their kids hooked up, but it would be great for them to know about it. So it's, uh, it's okay to know about that number, to make that, num or that information available to parents. Find out about parent-to-parent -parent programs for parent support. We have this wonderful thing called the Father's Network in Washington where dads just get together. We have great internet resources in Washington. One is called Informing Families Building Trust, and it provides general information for parents on a really wide range of uh, 
information. And last year, I did three trainings online. Well, but they don't call them trainings or articles. Online um, on healthy relationships. Oh, dear. There it is. And that's Informing Families Building Trust. The other thing Informing Families Building Trust has is free binders for you to put information in or free folders. The folder has advocacy and family support statewide information. It's all covered, covered with information for families of children with a disability. And it would be a great way for you to organize the information that you're handing out to parents. And it is completely free. And you can access it through the website and request your free copies to keep on hand to hand out to parents when they come in. Another great resource for you How do you do this? Okay, I'm just going to paste it on there. Huh, I don't know if that worked. Huh. Clearly, I don't do this a lot. There so, anyway, yeah? Yes. So, the second email or the second. Um, website up there is for you to look up information on specific disabilities. So if you do have a child in front of you, you can, at your leisure, uh, get online and find out a little bit more about that disability so that you can understand what you're working with. When I first got here at the ARC, I printed out a whole book of this information so when people are talking to me, I can understand a little bit more about what that child is going through so that I can craft um, something that is useful to that family. So self-education is a huge recommendation. So to summarize, we're winding up early. Oh dear. I encourage you to build relationships with local, local disability service providers and to do it right now. Start today, find out who they are, give them a call, Pull them in. They need your information, and you need their referrals. Again, some organizations to consider are your local ARC chapters or Autism Washington. This may be hard for the agency to wrap their head around because, again, many of the people who work, if not all of the people who work at these agencies, are the parents who are struggling with these issues themselves. So go slow. Be gentle. They need it but they really don't want it. Some things to consider again proposing are cross-training, inviting them in to train about what their, uh, their knowledge of disability, getting on each other's councils and boards, and then working together to design plans uh, for shared clients. Learn about the resources in your community. In Spokane, we actually have a resource guide of resources uh, for parents of children with disabilities that all the staff at the local sexual assault service agency are able to have for themselves and to hand out for um, to hand out to parents. And I'm making a recommendation to list that for a book for their library. So disability Complex concept covers physical, mental, intellectual, but what it talks about is an impairment in functioning. Washington has approximately 60,000 children, 17 and under, with a disability. Children with disabilities are sexually abused at a higher rate than children without disabilities, and those with intellectual and developmental disabilities significantly more than anybody else. The vulnerabilities unique to children with disabilities include our ongoing societal beliefs about people with disabilities, the lack of education for either children or parents, and the nature and consequence of the disability itself. The effects on the family are of profound disorganization 
and isolation. And the three ways that you can improve advocacy is to understand and support that parent. More than any other child you meet, that child is going to be dependent on that relationship with that parent. If you're not sure, ask questions. They're not used to professionals admitting they don't know, so it'll be refreshing for them. And educate yourself just as much as you can about disability so that you have information to share with that parent. And one place to do that is with the Informing Families Building Trust website. So when we talk about curriculum, let's see, we have one person asking about um, if the person who committed the abuse is a family member versus external care provider, you get like a 50-50 chance of the abuse being family um, and 50% disability service provider. So I'm not sure what you're asking for for tips. So if you could expand that a little more, that would be really helpful. A curriculum to be used with parents, I'm pretty excited about the Where We Live curriculum from WICSAP. That can be modified to work with parents of children with disability. The same concerns that parents without disabilities have about other people's behaviors can be used with parents. I also have some cheat sheets that you could, if you like, hand out to parents about uh, future prevention of harm. I can, if you email me, make those available to anybody who wants them. And I'm going to try and type my email in here. Wish me luck. So what I do is I take the where we live curriculum and I um, modify that by adding information specific to children with disabilities. And then I recognize that the parents have more contact with adults and that those adults, say, uh, healthcare professionals, might not be as welcoming of parental suggestions like I want two people in the room at all times or I uh, want to pick up and drop off time that's really tight and concise. But it's possible. It's really possible for parents to set up situations where their children are significantly safer and at lower risk of assault. But if you're talking about advocacy in the moment, just really, really listen to those parents and connect with them just as much as you can because that connection is where all the healing is going to happen. Any questions? Anything else? Teresa, I don't think your email came through. Would you mind re-typing that in the box? I can. Okay, so it says send. Now did I go? Yes. Oh, yeah. So here are some of the references that I spoke about. And you will get those when you get the uh, printout. I have... A lot more information. If anybody wants it, just email me. I'll be happy to. The above link doesn't work for me. Tfears at arcdashbookan.org. To send you links that do work or to answer any questions you have about working with parents of kids with disabilities. I see that we're a little short of time. So let's call that question and answer time. Nope, nope, nobody wants to ask me questions. They just want to go. I see how you guys are. Okay. We can hang out for a few minutes in case people think of anything. So the reason I'm recommending family consequences of children's disabilities is that it was actually written for professionals. Um, who are not used to working with parents of kids with disabilities. So the fact that somebody took the time to do national research in the United States and then write a book just for professionals such as yourselves to increase your comfort in working with people with disabilities, 
I thought was a really great idea, and it's a pretty slim book. It's a quick read, and it's just chock a block full of very helpful, concise information. In fact, if each agency had that book, it would probably even be even better than checking it out from WixApp because then you could make photocopies for your office of things that were helpful to know. If you want to understand parents more on a sort of a personal level, if you get onto YouTube, you'll find that there are quite a lot of uploads of parents talking about their experience. And I found many of them to be just very moving and unfortunately quite long. So if you really want to know more about what it feels like from a parent's perspective and get that kind of parent take on it, definitely invest a little bit of time on YouTube and you're going to have your eyes opened up wide. It's amazing. <laughs>